Well, good evening, everybody. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's quite obvious that this is a, a very thriving organization. The hub and the, the buzz is fantastic. Um, I think that the president has really said virtually everything I was planning to say, but I, I, will, I will say it nevertheless, but perhaps at not too great length. Uh, you all know that this is the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. Uh, frankly, um, but please not to be quoted, Magna Carta is coming out of my ears at the moment. Um, we are still only not halfway through the year. Uh, we've still got six and a half months to go, and then, then it will all be over. <laughs> or not. Um, and in a week's time, uh, your president and I, and I know a number of others of you, will be turning up uh, at Runnymede, uh, we're all hoping that, uh, that it won't be a muddy field. I know my wife has told me that uh, all this to go and stand in a muddy field, she said, and to get up at about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, my role uh, is going to be little more than making a three-minute speech. And I, I've written my speech and I timed it. I've, I've read it sort of fast and then slow and then <laughs> middle speed. And I reckon I'm probably just about on the three-minute mark. Uh, but in all seriousness, it will be, I, I'm sure it'll be a fantastic occasion, and I'm very pleased that a lot of you will, will be there to join in it. One of the many legacies of the Magna Carta is that, as the President said, is that law is not the preserve of the rich and powerful, uh, and, and nor is that the practice of the law. And I know that Silex is playing an increasingly important role in ensuring that this is not the case in our society today, and in opening up access uh, and opportunities to successful legal careers to those who would otherwise not have been able to do it. Uh, I am sorry that I was not able to be at your big dinner in Cardiff to mark the anniversary, uh, although the Lord Chief Justice was there, uh, and um, so I feel that you were in good hands. I understand it was a, a great success, I'm told, but I don't quite understand how this came about, uh, that um, the cutlery that was presented for this banquet consisted of no more than a solitary knife. Uh, I think I understood that correctly. <laughs> but uh, although this, in this year of all years we are reflecting on the past uh, and the strengths of our system, uh, we must, of course, look uh, ahead. We're always being told by everybody, including our, our government, that we have the best judiciary in the world. When the government ministers say that to me, I, I, I assume that they mean what they say and they're not being facetious. But I, anyway, I take it in the best possible uh, sense. And that we have a legal profession which is second to none. Uh, I hope and believe that this is true. Uh, but we cannot afford to be complacent. The whole justice system has been facing and you don't need me to tell you this, has been facing massive challenges for some time now, uh, really going back to, to the time when the, the uh, financial crash occurred in 2008. And uh, as if um, we, we weren't facing um, enough problems, we were told last week that our unprotected department is facing further co cuts of 250 million. How that is to be achieved, well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, most people in the system think that there is n nothing more to cut. And now we're being told, apparently, that legal aid is not going to be uh, savaged any further. Uh, so we just have to wait and see what um, uh, people will come up with. But I, I, I'm frankly, <coughs> um, I think one needs quite a lot of imagination uh, to think what um, uh, further cuts there may be. You're all aware of the austerity uh, regime to which we are being subjected. The effect on court resources and legal aid is very serious indeed. You don't need me to tell you that. I wish I could say that I was confident that legal aid will be restored to something like its former levels within the foreseeable future. But in all honesty, I, I cannot 
do so. It would be wonderful to think that um, the economy will pick up magnificently and that uh, legal aid will be restored. Maybe it will happen, but uh, at the moment uh, there is no reason to suppose that it will happen. But there are some silver linings, and foremost amongst these is the reform program which, uh, which uh, ASM, HMCTS, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, is working on, and which I, I hope and believe will be implemented. Now, tonight is not the time to go into the, the, the great detail of, of what's being done. Uh, Natalie Sini, who is the chief executive of HMCTS, is doing a brilliant job. She's a very dynamic person, uh, and I believe that she is impressing everybody, including the department. The reform will entail, amongst other things, modernization of the civil and family system. The uh, criminal uh, system is already somewhat ahead of the game. Uh, it will involve modernization of those systems by uh, digitization, and I hope the adoption of an online dispute resolution system uh, as uh, was advocated by the Civil Justice Council uh, in a, a report that I presented to the media together with its principal author, Richard Suskind. Uh, th th I think this is a very exciting project. There's a, a lot of work to be done on it. There'll be a lot of um, dis difficult decisions uh, as to what uh, categories of case shall be uh, the subject of this uh, system in the first instance, and if it succeeds, where uh, and how we progress it. One uh, area, and again this has been touched on by your president, one uh, area where um, I think we're all sharing the same concern is in relation to the significant increases in court fees. Uh, I, I uh, made my views together with those of the senior judiciary well known to government, um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I have a, a real concern that this is going to have a very damaging effect on access to justice not of the Russian oligarchs. I, I, I know that there are those in the city who believe that even um, those sorts of claims will be uh, possibly uh, jeopardized by the increase in court fees. Um, I, I find that, frankly, rather difficult to believe. But the claims that I am very worried about are those in the range between, uh, I think it's 10,000 pounds and 200,000 pounds, where the 5% figure will apply. And I find it very difficult to believe uh, that um, small businessmen, the hard-working British worker we've always been told about, uh, who has a claim for, say, 50,000 pounds, that that person will not be um, uh, deterred in some instances from uh, accessing the courts. But we'll have to wait and see. We've only, I think, got one month's results in, and that's uh, obviously nothing like enough to enable us to detect the trend. One very noticeable feature of the modern courts, uh, uh, as we all know, of course, is the litigant in person. And I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank you, all of you, for your role in collaborating with the Bar Council and the Law Society to produce guidance for the profession on handling cases involving unrepresented parties. I was very pleased to see that the emphasis on a lawyer's duty to the court and the administration of justice, as well as to the client. There is a lot of work being done, uh, and has been for some time now, by the Civil Justice Council uh, to try to assist litigants in person to access the courts and understand what goes on in the courts, and to help judges to, to deal with them in a sensitive and efficient way. Judges, like lawyers, are having to adapt to the new world and assist litigants in person so far as they're able to in the interest of justice. Mrs. Justice Asplin has been doing fantastic work on, in this respect, including new and improved training for judges. We're very lucky in this country to have, and again, I agree with your president, to have so many people willing to do pro bono work. And we're also very lucky to have the personal support unit, uh, PSU. Uh, I think that they've grown from strength to strength in a very um, short period of time uh, and uh, I think that we should all celebrate the fact that all this voluntary work is being done. It of course would be much better if we didn't need to rely on it but the fact is 
uh, that we are where we are and, and we are much assisted by all of this. And I, I, the, some of you may have been on the legal charities walk before Easter. In fact, I, I know you were because I remember seeing a T-shirt, a Silex T-shirt. Um, well, you might be interested to know that more than £600,000 was raised on that walk, which is wonderful. Uh, one uh, area in which the judiciary has been looking at and intends to embark on a public consultation later this year is guidance on Mackenzie Friends. Again, another somewhat hot potato. The um, Mackenzie, a good Mackenzie Friend is extremely helpful in the, this time of litigants in person. But there is a real controversial question about whether we should permit um, uh, professional Mackenzie friends to appear in court, people who are paid. Uh, and I'm sure you're all aware of the arguments. We are um, having to consult on this. But there are serious problems that this group of persons, if we allow them, they would be, uh, unless something is done to change the situation, they'd be unregulated, uh, query whether they'd have insurance, would they owe a duty to the court. These are fairly profound questions which need to be addressed. Uh, before we say yes to them if we decide to do that. Uh, the, uh, your profession is growing in importance and in influence in our legal system. And make, make, uh, you should be under no doubt about that. It really is remarkable that the uh, progress that you've made in such a short space of time. And I uh, congratulate you on all that you have achieved and that you are continuing to achieve. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it is wonderful that uh, we are having this um, dinner here tonight. Uh, I was provided with some of the statistics about, about uh, um, Silex, and I, was, I actually had no idea uh, how many members of Silex there are. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying that the great contribution that you make uh, is to enable people who have not enjoyed the privilege that people like I and some of my colleagues here have enjoyed of going to university and just sliding, I wouldn't say effortlessly, but at any rate, sliding into professions. Um, and there's a, there are all, a lot of people out there whom you are helping to um, uh, access this wonderful profession of ours. And so um, I, I think that you have every right to be proud of what you are achieving. I have no doubt that you will go from strength to strength. You are now one of the three pillars of the legal profession. And um, there is no stopping you, frankly. I mean, judicial appointments uh, round the corner, I have little, little doubt. So I want to congratulate you all uh, and uh, to wish you well. Um, I hope that uh, I, I will be able to come to your next di dinner. I remember last year's dinner when the speaker keynote speaker was uh, the, the then Lord Chancellor. Uh, the landscape has changed a little <laughs> since then. I, I don't suppose that uh, Mr. Grayling uh, necessarily uh, lingers in his memory over that particular occasion, but I remember that the speech, that um, the, the other speech that was not, entire, not, not quite so kind to him uh, <laughs> as I think uh, the reception that I have had tonight. Now, um, I, I'm going to conclude. Uh, I've probably spoken far too long, but I, I'm conscious that what I've said is, is, is rather earnest and serious. And I'm conscious that all oh, this is not quite an after-dinner speech. It's, it's a, an after-main course speech. Um, and I, I know that there is a pudding around the corner. Uh, but I thought that I would tell you a, a, a story. Uh, and I know that at least one of you here has, has heard this story before. In fact, he's a He's a politician who uh, has, has used this story. He knows who, who he is. Um, and w when uh, he told me that he'd used this story, because he'd heard it from me, I said, well, that, I, you can't do that. It's my story. <laughs> and, and, and he said, ah, but it's a good story. And we politicians, we get up to all sorts of mischief, he said. Anyway, my story has got nothing whatsoever to do with Silex. And so I hope you will forgive me if I nevertheless tell you my story. And it, it all goes back to... Uh, when I was um, a juror uh, at the, the building, the Middlesex Crown Court, which is now where the Supreme Court uh, functions. 
uh, and um, I, I was um, uh, I, I sat on the jury, and uh, the, f the first case we had was a very trifling little case. And um, I, I'm afraid, and I became the foreman, and I'm not allowed to tell you how that happened, uh, but I, uh, it, it did happen. And um, I thought we'd just go around the, the table to find out what people thought. And I, I, I thought that the man was palpably guilty. Um, but one by one, they said, no, they didn't agree. Uh, I'm breaching my oath, by the way, so... Um, <laughs> But I've done it so often already. <laughs> and so, um, and the basis for saying that this man was not guilty was, was, could only be to completely defy a direction as to the law that had been given by the judge. And uh, I gently pointed this out to them, but they, they frankly weren't interested. And therefore, we, I'm afraid, we acquitted this palpably guilty man. <laughs> I then uh, moved on to the to uh, the panel for the next case in a different court. And um, my name was called out. And, uh, and so I was quite looking forward to sitting on another case because it's, you frankly waste so much time hanging about uh, when you go to, sit, to uh, sit on a jury that it's wonderful when you actually get a case. And my name was called out and uh, the judge, um, the resident judge of the court, said, this, this juror should stand down. He's well known to me. Uh, now, uh, I knew this resident judge because I'd sat with him for a period of three weeks in the Court of Criminal Appeal. Uh, and that was the extent of my acquaintance with this judge. And um, the, uh, the, the woman uh, who I was standing next to as I sheepishly withdrew turned to me and she said, what you done then? <laughs> well, now you can see why the politician uh, who remembered the story, and, and I'm not quite sure how he uh, used it to his advantage, because it, it wasn't his story, but it, <laughs> but it was my story. And so I think without more ado, I'm going to say that it's time that the pudding was brought on. Thank you very much.